Hello, welcome to week three uh, for these two videos. Uh, we're going to look at the founding of the United States. And the first of the two videos for this week is on the American Revolution. And I know this is something that's been studied over and over and over again, so I don't want to, you know, beat a dead horse, so to speak. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what happens before the American Revolution, and then I'll talk a little bit about the American Revolution itself. So, try to cover it all pretty simply. And in many ways, the beginning of the American Revolution can be traced back to 1756. Now, I know you might be saying, but I thought the Declaration of Independence was in 1776 and all that. Yes, it was. But as any good story goes, there's a story before the story. Now, the Seven Years' War is something that's not talked about a whole lot, but it was actually a global war. Uh, it started here in what is today in the United States, but in reality, there was fighting in Europe, there was fighting in Africa, there was fighting in Asia, there was fighting everywhere, in India too. And it's a seven years war. It actually lasts seven years, 1756 to 1753. Now, the North American portion of this, it's between France and England, and it really starts because of a disagreement over the Ohio Territory which was Eastern Ohio, Western Pennsylvania. Uh, France wants to build a series of fortifications to protect their fur regions. England thinks it's part of the Virginia claim. And the English are going to send George Washington and General Edward Braddock in 1754 and 1755 into the Ohio Territory, where they're going to come up against these French military outposts and they're going to fight against the French. And the English forces are beaten back by the French and their Native American allies. Um, George Washington is going to have a fort built named Fort Prince George. Fort Prince George is never finished, it's taken by the French and then renamed Fort Duquesne. Well, George Washington then is going to build something called Fort Necessity. And from Fort Necessity in 1756, he's going to send out a military party to kind of search and get information. And they come across some French soldiers. These French aligned soldiers come back to Fort Necessity and the English kill them. George Washington doesn't really stop them. I mean, he doesn't really want them to die, but he doesn't stop these French soldiers from being killed either. So that's kind of how this starts. And you're going to have the British and their native allies fighting against the French and their native allies. And the North American portion of this war is really going to go from 1756 until 1760. Now, during this time, the British forces are going to capture all the major French outposts. And by 1763, the war is over. The Peace of Paris, 1763, is signed. And France gives up all its claims to North America. So France is going to be kicked out of the war, or out of the continent. And the Native Americans who have been using the French versus the English for decades now suddenly can't do that anymore. The French are gone, the English are completely in control. Also, Britain is going to issue something called the Proclamation of 1763. Now this Proclamation of 1763 is going to be very important. And it's going to say that no colonist can go past the Appalachian Mountains. Even though England or Britain is going to get control of all the land up to the Mississippi River, the colonists are not allowed to use the land between the mountains and the river. Now, in the colonist mind, uh, they have fought for this land and they have earned this land. Um, somewhere around one third of men in the colonies of military age fought in the war. They were treated as second-class citizens, they received harsh discipline, and the British Army refused to respect agreements that they made with the colonels, or colonials, I should say. 
such as the terms of enlistment. So the colonists are very angry because they're not treated like British subjects. They're not allowed to go into this land that they feel like they have been fighting for. And if that's not enough, Britain is going to blame the start of this war on the colonists and tell them that they have to pay their fair share. So in 1763, King George III is going to appoint a gentleman named Lord Grenville to be the Prime Minister. And the Prime Minister Grenville is going to have the Sugar Act and the Currency Act passed, which is going to, in theory, increase tax revenue. Now, the Sugar Act, its only job was to stop the smuggling of molasses uh, or stop the smuggling of sugar. By stopping this trade, this black market of sugar and molasses, Lord Grenville and the British government were trying to force the colonists to buy only from British sources. That way, the crown would get any tax money. The Currency Act, on the other hand, outlawed any colonial money. All of the, the different colonies had their own form of currency in addition to regular British currency. So there was colonial paper money in Massachusetts, there was colonial paper money in Georgia, et cetera, et cetera. Currency Act made it so only British currency would be accepted, which is something that a lot of the colonials didn't have. Now, at almost the same time this is going on, there's a movement in England called the Real Whig Movement. And these real Whigs are worried that the government was getting tyrannical and had almost dictatorial powers. And there was this real worry that the government of England was corrupt. Well, that idea, the real Whig movement, takes hold in America where the colonial legislatures already have this sense of self-government. And the British Parliament, which is supposed to be based on representation, tries to argue that the colonists are virtually represented, and that doesn't go over so well. If you move on to 1765, we have the Stamp Act being passed, and it required a tax stamp on most printed materials, whether that's newspapers, pamphlets, wills, deeds, even playing cards had a tax. And the idea, once again, was the tax would raise money to pay off the war debt, and all the tax scores had to be paid in either British coins or gold, or silver coins. The colonists didn't like this at all. Uh, James Otis Jr., who was a member of the Virginia House of Burgesses, uh, he's going to declare taxation without representation is tyranny. We know that phrase better today as no taxation without representation. The entire Virginia House of Burgesses is going to declare the Stamp Act illegal, and they say Virginia resolves that they're subject to taxation only by parliamentary assembly. Since no colonial representative was in parliament, um, the tax is not in effect. You also have the Sons of Liberty formed in 1765 to resist the Stamp Act. And this is made up of urban elites, lawyers, merchants, tradesmen, the people who actually use the printed material. They refuse to buy that stuff. Now, the Sons of Liberty are going to spread and there's going to be branches of the Sons of Liberty up and down the coast in small towns and cities. 
And then also 1765, we get something called the Stamp Act of Congress that will be formed. And this is going to be an intercolonial Congress. And it meets in New York City in October of 1765. And its whole purpose is to write a unified statement of protest. Now, it's very conservatively written. So that way, um, it doesn't offend Parliament. But still, it's a fairly important move. It's the first time that the Collins have openly defied Parliament. Now, the Stamp Act will be repealed in 1766, but it's replaced by something called the Declaratory, Declaratory Act. And in the Declaratory Act, uh, it's decreed that Parliament has the authority to tax and legislate the British colonies in North America in whatever way it wants to. Now, this doesn't receive much attention because everybody's celebrating that the Stamp Act has been repealed. But the new Prime Minister, Lord Rockingham, is really thumbing his nose at the colonists without them realizing. Now, continuing, in 1767, there is another Prime Minister. Lord Rockingham is replaced by William Pitt. And one of the first things William Pitt does is he appoints Charles Townsend to be the head of the Exchequer, meaning the head of the, the um, Treasury. And Charles Townsend, the head of the Treasury, or the Exchequer, is going to do an audit on the funds. Now, what Townsend finds is that the colonists still owe money. The war debt has not been paid off. And he is going to create new taxes, not to pay for the war debt directly, but the taxes that will be paid will be used to fund the British government in North America. By doing that, the money Britain would have spent for the North America government can be used to pay off all the war debt. So the debt has to be paid, and it's paid in a series of taxes that collectively become known as the Townsend Act. Now, this is going to be a tax on trade goods, glass, paper, cloth, and even tea. Now, I know that sounds similar to the Navigation Act, but what's different the Navigation Acts and the Sugar Act and all those were you had to pay extra money on goods from other countries. With the Townsend Acts, taxes have to be paid on things from other countries and from Britain. Now, Boston, Massachusetts, they're the ringleaders in this. They are very angry. The Massachusetts Assembly is going to issue a letter, send it to all colonial legislatures, and they, they're calling for a unified petition to be sent to Parliament in protest. They figure it worked with the Stamp Act, it'll work with this one too. However, the guy who is the British Secretary of State for America ordered the Massachusetts governor to stop the letter from being sent, and then he ordered the other royal governors pre to pre prevent their legislatures from uh, discussing it. And you know that they're going to do the exact opposite of what they're supposed to. Now, the resistance in Boston is going to get even worse. Uh, Mass the Massachusetts Assembly is going to openly defy everything that the British Secretary of State uh, says. And the Boston Sons of Liberty are going to lead some public protests. And pamphlets are going to be sent out and everything. And they're going to go so far as to call for a boycott of all the British goods. Because of the resistance in Boston, uh, the Massachusetts colony is going to be placed under royal control. Now, when we get to 1770 with the Boston Massacre, things are just going to go off the deep end. Um, there's a new prime minister again named Lord North. 
Lord North is going to repeal the Townsend Act on everything except for tea. On top of that, the British are going to station two entire regiments of troops in Boston. And these troops, they're going to compete with local Bostonian laborers for jobs when they're off duty. Uh, the troops are very intrusive on their search. And on March 2nd, 1770, the workers are going to attack the troops. There's not any serious harm or anything. But the workers are going to come back again on March 5th, and they're going to throw snowballs at the troops. And within the snowballs are rocks. The troops are going to open fire on these workers despite orders not to. Five workers are going to be killed. So the Boston Massacre happens probably a little differently than you've been told. John Adams, who is a lawyer, he's going to defend the troops. He is going to he's going to actually defend the troops who did the killing, and the defendants are all going to be acquitted. Now, finally, in 1773, we have the Tea Act that's passed, and the Tea Act in 1773, its primary job is to save the British East India Company from going bankrupt. The British East India Company is going to be the only authorized agent to sell tea in the colonies. A portion of the sales proceeds are going to go to the British East India Company. And before you know it, in Boston, the people are going to start protesting the royal governor, a gentleman named Thomas Hutchinson. So in December 1773, about 5,000 members of Boston's population are going to ask Thomas Hutchinson to send the tea back to England. He refuses, of course, because he, he can't do anything else. And later in the evening, about 60 men are going to disguise themselves as Mohawks. They're going to jump on a couple of tea boats and they're going to throw about 10,000 British pounds worth of tea into the Boston Harbor. Today that's a couple million dollars worth of tea. Now it's important to know also we're not talking like individual tea bags, we're talking about bricks of tea. When Lord North finds out about the tea party, he's going to pass something called the Coercive Acts and that closes down the port of Boston. It limits who the colonies can trade with, and it makes the governor of Massachusetts basically a dictator. We also have something called the Quebec Acts in 1774. It gives Catholics more freedom in Quebec, and that really makes the colonists worry about what's going on. So we get the first Continental Congress meeting in September of 1774. There are 55 delegates from all 13 colonies that meet in Philadelphia. Many of these people are radicals, but there are some conservative leaders. And the first Continental Congress is going to kind of meet in the middle. It's going to reject the radical proposals. It's going to reject the conservative proposals, and it's going to settled in the middle on something known as the Declaration of Rights and Grievances. And Congress, this Continental Congress, they're going to say that they will obey bona fide acts of parliament, meaning acts of parliament where they have some say. Problem is, what would be considered a bona fide act? Is it where the colonists get to have a vote, the colonists get to give their input, or if somebody represents the colonists and decides for them. Not really decided. At the same time that this Continental Congress is meeting, uh, April 1775, uh, General Thomas Gage, who's commanding the British troops in Boston, he's going to receive a letter from the British Secretary of State for America um, saying, hey, these resistance leaders that are happening, that's an unruly mob, and they wouldn't really fight back if you just put your foot down and try to get rid of them. And Lord Dartmouth, the British Secretary of State, is going to order 
General Gage to arrest the leaders of the resistance movement and to do it quickly and violently. So on April 18th of 17. 75, Gage prepares to march his troops to the city of Concord, where he's going to capture weapons. Paul Revere, William Dawes, and Samuel Prescott are going to get on horses and warn the British are coming, the British are coming. On April 19th, on the way to the city of Concord, the British are confronted by an American militia at Lexington Square. And a fighting skirmish breaks out. The British continue on to the city of Concord. They take the weapons and they march back to Boston. And by nightfall of May 20th, 1775, there are over 20,000 colonial militia gathered outside Boston ready to fight. So the American Revolution is going to big and the Second Continental Congress is going to meet in May of 1776. And this is like the last ditch effort to stop the war from happening. Um, they understand that they kind of have to play both ends. So there's an agreement to finance the war. The Second Continental Congress, they agree, okay, let's print about $2 million in paper money. Uh, of course, the paper money is not worth anything unless it's accepted by somebody. It's decided to appoint General George Washington, or George Washington as general, not necessarily because he was the best choice, but because he was really the only choice. He was the only person in the colonial army who had served as an, a high-ranking officer in the British Army. That's important to know, this is not in any way national government. The Second Continental Congress was supposed to be like the First Continental Congress, just to kind of get people working together and try to find a solution. On July 5th and July 6th, there is an attempt to make a compromise. Uh, the attendees of the Second Continental Congress, they pass something called the Olive Branch Petition, where they say, Dear George II, we are still loyal to you. Can we please kiss and make up? Then they also write the Declaration of the Causes and Necessities of Taking Up Arms. In the Declaration of the Causes and Necessity of Taking Up Arms, it's explained to King George III and the British government why the colonists were fighting. They thought they were just defending their rights. And George III, when he gets these two letters, he's just completely outraged. He basically says, let's treat the colonists like open and avowed enemies. Now, it's important to know not everybody is going to support the, the war. Only two out of five people in the colonies were what you would consider a rebel. Yeah, it's 40%. 20% were 100% loyalists, and 20% were neutral. They didn't know which side to go. Well, you've got a gentleman named Thomas Paine. He's a very influential author, and he's going to write a book called Common Sense. And you do have to read some of Common Sense this week. And Thomas Paine is basically going to blame King George III for everything that's gone wrong. Thomas Paine is going to say it makes no sense for the island of Great Britain to rule an entire continent. He's going to say that America would be better off by itself militarily, financially, economically, you name it. And Thomas Paine, more than anybody else, really convinces people that revolution is needed. So revolution is going to start, and we have a couple questions. What are the different strategies going to be? Well, the British initially see this as really no different than any other European war. We're going to control the cities. We're going to defeat the enemy in a clear military victory. And we're going to show dominance. The Americans, on the other hand, all they have to do is play defense. 
if the Americans can last and last and last and, and make the British people dislike the war, then Parliament can't keep it going. The other thing that the Americans want to do is get outside help. So they're going to look for help and they're going to find that from France, who wants to get back at Great Britain for their loss in the Seven Years War. Now, there are a lot of different battles that we can go through, but I'm only going to go through some of them. The first battle is actually for African American loyalty. I know it's not up here, but it's important to say. Uh, many African Americans saw an alliance with Britain promising, and there's even a British general named Lord Dunmore who promises freedom to any slave who will fight with the British. Now, after the war is over, Lord Dunmore actually makes good on his promise, and over 3,000 former slaves are settled in the province of Nova Scotia. Then we also have actual fights. Uh, the first battles of the war are going to be the Battle of Long Island and the Battle of Manhattan. The Battle of Long Island is actually the largest battle of the war. Uh, George Washington is going to dig in on Long Island in New York. The British are going to sail up with their gigantic battleships, and they're going to blow the Continental Army up, for lack of better words. George Washington is forced to retreat to the colony of New Jersey. The British are going to gain control of New York City for the rest of the war because of that. At the end of 1776, during the Christmas break, the battles of Trenton and Princeton are going to happen. Uh, that's where Washington crosses the Delaware River, and then Washington is going to capture a force of Hessians. And if you don't know what a Hessian is, it's okay. Uh, a Hessian, it's H-E-S-S-I-A-N. Uh, the uh, the Hessians are paid troops. They're actually German troops that the British army is paying to fight for them. Now, the importance of these two battles are that morale was boosted. People realized, hey, we have a shot to win this. And it inspired the colonists to fight. We also have the Saratoga campaign that happens throughout the uh, summer months of 1777. The British think that they can split the colonies into two if the British army were to go from the colony of Quebec and go straight down the Hudson River Valley. They can meet up with their force in New York City. The New England colonies would be separated from the rest of the fight. The problem with this, though, is that as the British move further and further down from Quebec, from Quebec to Lake Champlain to the Hudson River, uh, he got further and further away from his supplies, and he ran into a larger and larger American presence. And before you know it, um, the British supply line is cut off, and the British Army, led by Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne, has to turn around and retreat. So now we have the battles at Trenton and Princeton where it looks like they have a chance. And now the Saratoga campaign, the British Army has actually had to retreat and go back home. Now the winter at uh, Valley Forge, that's the winter of 1777 going into 1778, not a battle, but it's, it's a turning point to war. Um, there is a, at the time, armies didn't fight all year round. When it turned cold and when it was winter, armies basically sat down and didn't do anything until spring. And George Washington is going to do that with the Continental Army in Pennsylvania at a place called Valley Forge. Uh, Valley Forge was far enough away where they wouldn't be discovered, but it was close enough that they could march back to the battlefield when it got warmer. And there's a lot of starvation, a lot of disease, there's a lot of malnutrition during this time. Um, that's the downside. The good thing, though, is that a Prussian 
soldier named Baron von Steuben is going to come and volunteer with Washington, and he's going to train Washington's soldiers to be an actual professional army. On top of that, after seeing the success that the Americans had during the Saratoga campaign, France is going to send a representative to Washington as well. And before you know it, Baron von Steuben has turned these ragtag soldiers into an actual army, and France is going to send over reinforcements. Now, finally, we get to the Civil War in the South. Britain is going to take over Savannah in 1778, and Savannah is going to stay in British hands until the end of the war. But the Americans are going to fight in South Carolina, and the city of Charleston will fall to the British in 1780. But at the Battle of Camden, near Camden, South Carolina, things start to change a little bit. At the Battle of Camden, the British are going to win, but it makes the colonists regroup. And when the fighting goes into North Carolina, the battle just keeps going further and further north, it turns out that when the, the war goes into North Carolina, the colonists are going to surprise the Loyalist forces and they're going to win big in fight after fight after fight. So before you know it, Cornwallis, who is the head of the Southern Army of the British, is going to have to retreat to a place called Yorktown, which is on the coast of Virginia. Now Cornwallis, he's going to hold up in Virginia because he's waiting for reinforcements to come from Britain. Unfortunately for General Cornwallis, he gets cornered by Washington and this joint American-French army, and he's going to be surrounded on three out of four sides by enemy forces. He's not that worried, though, because his back is to the ocean, and he's like, the British army will be reinforced because the British Navy will be here any day. Well, unfortunately for Lord Cornwallis, the British Navy did not get there first, the French Navy. So unexpectedly, Lord Cornwallis, or General Cornwallis, finds himself surrounded on all four sides by enemy forces, and he is forced to surrender on October 7th of 1781. Now, just an interesting tidbit about this surrender at Yorktown. Um, Cornwallis asked for something called the honors of battle meaning his troops would be allowed to march off the battlefield under their own flag. They would surrender all their weapons, but they would be able to march off the battlefield under their own flag. And George Washington refused. So Cornwallis ordered his second in command to surrender. And Cornwallis' second command goes to the French commander, and tries to surrender to the French. The French refuse and point to George Washington. When Cornwallis' is second in command goes to George Washington, George Washington says, uh-uh, and points to his second command. So Cornwallis never actually surrenders to, to Washington. It's Cornwallis' is second in command who surrenders to Washington, second in command. All right, how does this whole thing end? Well, it's in the Treaty of Paris 1783. And you can read here what the, the stipulations were. And if you're reading this, you'll see it's not really that bad. Basically, it's a slap on the wrist for the British colonists, it's a slap on the wrist for Britain itself. And a lot of people ask me when they see this or when I talk about this, why was this so friendly to the Americas? This surrender, so to speak. And quite frankly, it's because Great Britain thought that the American experiment would fail and that the American colonies would eventually come back home to mom. 
uh, where 240 something years later in the United States are still not ready to call to uh, crawl back to Mars. So at this point, I don't think it's ever going to happen. But um, ultimately, the Treaty of Paris 1783 goes into effect on September 3rd, 1783. And in many ways, September 3rd, 1783 is the true birth of America. All right, that's it for this video. We'll have another one here in a little bit for you to look for. But until then, we'll see you soon. Bye.